while climate finance has been a central element of the negotiations in one form or another since 1992, it is now most often associated with a target figure of mobilizing $100 billion a year by 2020 by developed countries for developing countries. This target was first agreed in the Copenhagen Accord in 2009 and expanded upon in the Cancun Agreement in 2010, where the Green Climate Fund was established to act as a key delivery mechanism. In the Paris Agreement in 2015, this target was further reinforced with a goal to raise the target after 2025 and that this funding would come from a wide variety of sources, public and private, bilateral and multilateral, including alternative sources of finance. The $100 billion target has now become a political focal point for further discussions around many aspects of climate change-related finance, particularly those related to developing countries. The debate is now focused on the detail of how to deliver this in line with meeting the Paris target and the Sustainable Development Goals, in particular how the $100 billion should be raised, if this target is enough, who should provide it, what financing mechanisms should be used, how it can be accessed, and where it should be distributed. First, and I would say most importantly, we should all remind ourselves that there is more than enough money to finance all of these issues and more. And that, if we keep reminding ourselves that, I think we will actually get to the final conclusion point. I want to... I want to throw a few numbers out there. There's $300 trillion, that's right, trillion dollars in financial assets globally. The million wealthiest American households have collectively $11 trillion of investable assets. There's $100 trillion sitting in institutional investor pots of, of money. There are single digit trillions of dollars today in negative yielding instruments. And on and on and on. There's over a trillion and a half dollars sitting on the sidelines of private equity firms all around this country and the world. So there is more than enough money to solve these problems, and we should always remind ourselves. That's number one. Number two is that this theme and trend of sustainable investing slash ESG, environmental, social, and governance, it is real, it is persistent, and it's happening across the investment industry. This is no longer a fad. This is no longer some sideshow. This is becoming full-on mainstream part of how we invest money. The Coalition for Urban Transitions says in its report titled Financing Low Carbon, Climate Resilient Cities. In many parts of the world, urban development is becoming more inefficient, unsustainable and carbon intensive. Urban spatial expansion is outstripping urban population growth and the share of urban trips by private vehicles is increasing in all developing regions. Meanwhile, millions of urban residents lack access to risk-reducing infrastructure and services, such as sewers, piped water, drains, water collection or health care. Sustainable investing in ESG is, is real, and our job as an investment community is to make it even more real. So there are more investors talking about how do I align my investments with the world we want to live in, it's our job as asset managers and it's all of our job in this room to make sure that that's real and that investment products like this and like green bonds and the great work of the World Bank are ways to express that. That's number two. Number three is to make all of this real when it comes to infrastructure, we have to get the projects right. Any discussion around sustainable finance and infrastructure will ultimately get to this issue of bankable projects. We need well-structured projects that have clear revenue streams, that are dependable, and then from those projects you can find different types of capital that'll help finance it, but the projects come first. And so getting those projects right, working with the right project developers, getting the public policy right, and the revenue streams from the projects is exactly what's needed for more of this capital to go towards, that, towards those initiatives. A transition to low carbon Climate resilient cities will require both a substantial increase in the total quantity of urban infrastructure investment and a shift in the way that existing streams of finance are allocated. There is therefore a need for innovation, learning, and scaling of financing instruments, financial architecture, and governance structures.
The United Nations says Latin America and the Caribbean is the second most urbanized region on the planet, with eight out of ten people living in cities. Between 1950 and 2014, the region urbanized at an unprecedented rate, raising its urban population as percentage of total from 50% to 80%, a figure that is expected to climb to 86% by 2050. Over the past two decades, the region's urban population and economic growth has been increasingly taking place in intermediate-sized cities, which are expanding exponentially. The Emerging and Sustainable Cities Initiative seeks to address these challenges by developing planning tools like greenhouse gas inventories and risk maps, as well as action plans to put cities in Latin America and the Caribbean on a sustainable pathway that includes low-carbon, climate-resilient development. Rapid urbanization has really um, brought with it many challenges and some potential serious threats to the sustainable development and quality of lives of people, uh, as well as natural capital in particular. Uh, a, neat, a key challenge uh, is sustainable infrastructure and, and getting finance from the national, the federal level down to the city level is a, is a particular challenge. Now we as the IDB group, um, we don't finance municipalities directly. Uh, we either have a sovereign, go through the sovereign uh, federal level or uh, we can do private sector financing uh, without a sovereign guarantee. And so um, it's really important that as we engage with the governments uh, at the federal level, we bring uh, the importance of uh, working with cities around implementation of their climate objectives and their NDCs. So clearly with 80% of the population in cities, uh, it's clearly going to be critical that cities are enabled by governments, by their governments, to finance the implementation of climate actions that will contribute towards their NDCs. According to the World Bank, the financing required for an orderly transition to a low-carbon, climate-resilient global economy can be counted in trillions, not billions. The bank says over the next 15 years, the world will require about $90 trillion in new infrastructure, most of it in developing and middle-income countries. Making the right choices in favor of infrastructure that is climate resilient that locks in a low carbon development pathway is critical and urgent as action now will avoid huge costs later. It's something called the Global Green Bond Partnership, which is with a number of, with EIB that you saw here, but Amundi, UNDP, Ceres, the Climate Bonds Initiative, the Global Covenant of Mayors, ICLE, and a few others. And what this partnership will do is really going to try to help cities accelerate their ability to um, issue green bonds according to the green bond principles. That you, and will really help with customized technical assistance and capacity building, um, de-risking, and helping them actually come to financial closure on specific um, transactions. And it also has something called a green bond readiness toolkit that helps cities look specifically at where they're constrained and, and what's, where they're not competitive and then what steps specifically um, the, the barriers they need to overcome what they need to take. So the partners are coming together in the next few weeks um, to start developing the action plan that will um, take forth uh, in 2019. The World Bank Group, along with other multinational development banks, continues to make a strong contribution to the global climate challenge. Collectively, the multilateral development banks increased their climate financing in developing countries and emerging economies to $35.2 billion in 2017, including more than $13 billion from the World Bank Group. The World Bank warns that by 2050, without concrete climate and development action, more than 143 million people in three regions, that is, in sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America and South Asia, could be forced to move within their own countries to escape the slow onset impact of climate change, such as water stress and crop failure. Meanwhile, the new Climate Economy Report released in advance of the Global Climate Action Summit titled Unlocking the Inclusive Growth Story of the 21st Century finds that transitioning to a low-carbon economy could result in $26 trillion in economic benefits worldwide through 2030 and also could generate over 65 million new low-carbon jobs in 2030 and avoid over 700,000 premature deaths from air pollution in 2030.
That's our program for the day. Thank you for watching our inbox test file at channastv.com. It's available for comments and questions. You can also view this episode or any other episode of the program by visiting our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash channelsweb. Do click the playlist menu and then click F file. You can also follow me on Twitter. From me, Ayo Lakasim, and the F file crew here in Lagos. It's bye for now.